The Empire of the Necromancers by Clark Ashton Smith The legend of Matmur and Sodosma shall arise only in the latter cycles of Earth, when the glad legends of the Prime have been forgotten. Before the time of its telling, many epochs shall have passed away, and the seas shall have fallen in their beds, and new continents shall have come to birth. Perhaps in that day, it will serve to beguile for a little, the black weariness of a dying race, grown hopeless of all but oblivion. I tell the tale, as men shall tell it in Zathik, the last continent, beneath the dim sun and sad heavens, where the stars come out in terrible brightness before eventide. Chapter 1 Matmur and Sodosma were necromancers, who came from the Dark Isle of Nott, to practice their baleful arts in Tinarath, beyond the shrunken seas. But they did not prosper in Tinarath, for death was deemed a holy thing by the people of that grey country, and the nothingness of the tomb was not likely to be desecrated, and the raising up of the dead by necromancy was held in abomination. So, after a short interval, Matmur and Sodosma were driven forth by the anger of the inhabitants, and were compelled to flee towards Sinka, a desert of the south, which was peopled only by the bones and mummies of a race that the pestilence had slain in former time. The land into which they went lay drear and leprous and ashen below the huge ember-coloured sun. Its crumbling rocks and deathly solitudes of sand would have struck terror to the hearts of common men. And since they had been thrust out in that barren place, without food or sustenance, the plight of the sorcerers might well have seemed a desperate one. But smiling secretly, with the air of conquerors who tread the approaches of a long coveted realm, Sodosma and Matmua walked steadily on into Sinka, unbroken before them, through fields devoid of trees and grass, and across the channels of dried-up rivers, there ran the great highway by which travellers had gone formerly between Sinka and Tinarath. Here they met no living thing, but soon they came to the skeletons of a horse and its rider lying full in the road, and wearing still the sumptuous harness and raiment which they had worn in the flesh. And Mahmur and Sardosma paused before the piteous bones on which no shred of corruption remained, and they smiled evilly at each other. The steed shall be yours, said Matmua, since you are a little the elder of us two, and are thus entitled to precedence, and the rider shall serve us both, and be the first to acknowledge fealty to us in Sinka. Then, in the ashy sand by the wayside, they drew a threefold circle, and standing together at its centre, they performed the abominable rites that compel the dead to arise from tranquil nothingness and obey henceforward, in all things, the dark will of the necromancer. Afterward, they sprinkled a pinch of magic powder on the nostril holes of the man and the horse, and the white bones, creaking mournfully, rose up from where they had lain, and stood in readiness to serve their masters. So, as had been agreed between them, Sodosma mounted the skeleton steed, and took up the jeweled reins, and rode in an evil mockery of death on his pale horse while Matmua trudged on beside him, leaning lightly on an ebon staff, and the skeleton of the man, with its rich raiment flapping loosely, followed behind the two like a servitor. After a while, in the grey waste, they found the remnant of another horse and rider, which the jackals had spared and the sun had dried to the leanness of old mummies. These also they raised up from death, and Matmua bestrode the withered charger, and the two magicians rode on in state like errant emperors with a lich and a skeleton to attend them. Other bones and charnel remnants of men and beasts, to which they came anon, were duly resurrected in like fashion, so that they gathered to themselves an ever-swelling train in their progress through Sinka. Along the way, as they neared Yethlerium, which had been the capital, they found numerous tombs and necropoli, inviolate still after many ages, and containing swathed mummies that had scarcely withered in death. All these they raised up and called from sepulchral night to do their bidding. Some they commanded to sow until the desert fields and hoist water from the sunken wells. Others they left at diverse tasks, such as the mummies had performed in life. The century-long silence was broken by the noise and tumult of myriad activities, and the lank liches of weavers toiled at their shuttles, and the corpses of ploughmen followed their furrows behind carrion oxen. Weary with their strange journey and their oft-repeated incantations, Matmur and Sodosma saw before them, at last, from a desert hill, the lofty spires and fair unbroken domes of Yethlerium, 
steeped in the darkening, stagnant blood of ominous sunset. It is a goodly land, said Matmua, and you and I will share it between us, and hold dominion over all its dead, and be crowned as emperors on the morrow in Yethlerim. Aye, replied Sodosma, for there is none living to dispute us here, and those that we have summoned from the tomb shall move and breathe only at our dictation, and may not rebel against us. So, in the blood-red twilight that thickened with purple, they entered Yethlirium and rode on among the lofty lampless mansions, and installed themselves with their grisly retinue, in that stately and abandoned palace, where the dynasty of Nimboth emperors had reigned for two thousand years with dominion over Sinka. In the dusty golden halls, they lit the empty lamps of Onyx, by means of their cunning sorcery, and supped on royal viands, provided from past years, which they evoked in like manner. Ancient and imperial wines were poured for them in moonstone cups, by the fleshless hands of their servitors, and they drank and feasted and reveled in phantasmagoric pomp, deferring till the morrow, the resurrection of those who lay dead in Yethlerium. They rose betimes in the dark crimson dawn, from the opulent palace beds in which they had slept, for much remained to be done. Everywhere in that forgotten city, they went busily to and fro, working their spells on the people that had died in the last year of the pest and had lain unburied. And having accomplished this, they passed beyond Yethlerium into that other city of high tombs and mighty mausoleums, in which lay the Nimboth emperors and the more consequential citizens and nobles of Sinka. Here they bade their skeleton slaves to break in the sealed doors with hammers. And then, with their sinful tyrannous incantations, they called forth the imperial mummies, even to the eldest of the dynasty, all of whom came walking stiffly, with lightless eyes, in rich swathings sewn with flame-bright jewels. And also, later, they brought forth to a semblance of life many generations of courtiers and dignitaries, moving in solemn pageant, with dark and haughty and hollow faces, the dead emperors and empresses of Sinka made obeisance to Matmua and Sodosma, and attended them like a train of captives through all the streets of Yethlirium. Afterward, in the immense throne room of the palace, the necromancers mounted the high double throne, where the rightful rulers had sat with their consorts. Amid the assembled emperors, in gorgeous and funereal state, they were invested with sovereignty by the seer hands of the mummy of Hestayan, earliest of the Nimboth line who had ruled in half-mythic years. Then all the descendants of Hestayan, crowding the room in a great throng, acclaimed with toneless echo-like voices, the dominion of Matmua and Sodosma. Thus did the outcast necromancers find for themselves an empire and a subject people in the desolate barren land, where the men of Tinarath had driven them forth to perish, reigning supreme over all the dead of Sinka, by virtue of their malign magic, they exercised a baleful despotism Tribute was borne to them by fleshless porters from outlying realms, and plague-eaten corpses and tall mummies, scented with mortuary balsams, went to and fro upon their errands in Yethlirium, or heaped before their greedy eyes from inexhaustible vaults, the cobweb-blackened gold and dusty gems of antique time. Dead labourers made their palace gardens to bloom with long-perished flowers. Liches and skeletons toiled for them in the mines, or reared superb, fantastic towers to the dying sun. Chamberlains and princes of old time were their cupbearers, and stringed instruments were plucked for their delight, by the slim hands of empresses with golden hair, that had come forth untarnished from the night of the tomb. Those that were fairest, whom the plague and the worm had not ravaged over much, they took for their lemons and made to serve their necrophilic lust. Chapter 2 In all things, the people of Sinka performed the actions of life at the will of Matmua and Sodasma. They spoke, they moved, they ate and drank as in life. They heard and saw and felt with the similitude of the senses that had been theirs before death. But their brains were enthralled by a dreadful necromancy. They recalled but dimly their former existence, and the state to which they had been summoned was empty and troublous and shadow-like. Their blood ran chill and sluggish, mingled with water of leth, and the vapours of Leth clouded their eyes. Dumbly, they obeyed the dictates of their tyrannous lords, without rebellion or protest, but filled with a vague, illimitable weariness, such as the dead must know, when having drunk of eternal sleep, they are called back once more to the bitterness of mortal being. They knew no passion or desire or delight, only the black languor of their awakening from Leth, 
and a grey ceaseless longing to return to that interrupted slumber. Youngest and last of the Nimboth emperors was Ilero, who had died in the first month of the plague, and had lain in his high-built mausoleum for 200 years before the coming of the necromancers. Raised up with his people and his fathers to attend the tyrants, Ilero had resumed the emptiness of existence without question and had felt no surprise. He had accepted his own resurrection and that of his ancestors, as one accepts the indignities and marvels of a dream. He knew that he had come back to a faded sun, to a hollow and spectral world, to an order of things in which his place was merely that of an obedient shadow. But at first he was troubled only, like the others, by a dim weariness and pale hunger for the lost oblivion. Drugged by the magic of his overlords, weak from the age-long nullity of death, he beheld, like a somnambulist, the enormities to which his fathers were subjected. Yet, somehow, after many days, a feeble spark awoke in the sodden twilight of his mind. Like something lost and irretrievable, beyond prodigious gulfs, he recalled the pomp of his reign in Yethlirium, and the golden pride and exultation that had been his in youth. And recalling it, he felt a vague stirring of revolt, a ghostly resentment against the magicians who had hailed him forth to this calamitous mockery of life. Darkly, he began to grieve for his fallen state and the mournful plight of his ancestors and his people. Day by day, as a cupbearer in the halls, where he had ruled aforetime, Ilero saw the doings of Matmua and Sodosma. He saw their caprices of cruelty and lust, their growing drunkenness and gluttony. He watched them wallow in their necromantic luxury and become lax with indolence, gross with indulgence. They neglected the study of their art. They forgot many of their spells. But still they ruled, mighty and formidable, and lolling on couches of purple and rose, they planned to lead an army of the dead against Tinnerath. Dreaming of conquest and of vaster necromancies, they grew fat and slothful as worms that have installed themselves in a charnel rich with corruption. And pace by pace, with their laxness and tyranny, the fire of rebellion mounted in the shadowy heart of Ilero, like a flame that struggles with Lethian damps. And slowly, with the waxing of his wrath, there returned to him something of the strength and firmness that had been his in life. Seeing the turpitude of the oppressors, and knowing the wrong that had been done to the helpless dead, he heard in his brain the clamour of stifled voices demanding vengeance. Among his fathers, through the palace halls of Yethlirium, Elero moved silently at the bidding of the masters, or stood awaiting their command. He poured in their cups of onyx the amber vintages, brought by wizardry from hills beneath a younger sun. He submitted to their contumelies and insults, and night by night he watched them nod in their drunkenness, till they fell asleep, flushed and gross, amid their arrogated splendour. There was little speech among the living dead, and son and father, daughter and mother, lover and beloved, went to and fro without sign of recognition, making no comment on their evil lot. But at last, one midnight, when the tyrants lay in slumber, and the flames wavered in the necromantic lamps. Ilero took counsel with Hestayan, his eldest ancestor, who had been famed as a great wizard in fable and was reputed to have known the secret lore of antiquity. Hestayan stood apart from the others in a corner of the shadowy hall. He was brown and withered in his crumbling mummy cloths, and his lightless obsidian eyes appeared to gaze still upon nothingness. He seemed not to have heard the questions of Ilero. But at length, in a dry, rustling whisper, he responded, I am old, and the night of the sepulchre was long, and I have forgotten much. Yet, groping backward across the void of death, it may be that I shall retrieve something of my former wisdom, and between us we shall devise a mode of deliverance. And Hestian searched among the shreds of memory, as one who reaches into a place where the worm has been, and the hidden archives of old time have rotted in their covers till at last he remembered and said, I recall that I was once a mighty wizard, and among other things I knew the spells of necromancy, but employed them not, deeming their use and the raising up of the dead. An abhorrent act. Also, I possessed other knowledge, and perhaps among the remnants of that ancient law, there is something which may serve to guide us now. For I recall a dim, dubitable prophecy made in the primal years at the founding of Yethlirium and the Empire of Sinka. The prophecy was that an evil greater than death would befall the emperors and the people of Sinka in future times, 
and that the first and the last of the Nimboth dynasty, conferring together, would effect a mode of release and the lifting of the doom. The evil was not named in the prophecy, but it was said that the two emperors would learn the solution of their problem by the breaking of an ancient clay image that guards the nethermost vault below the imperial palace in Yethlurium. Then, having heard this prophecy from the faded lips of his forefather, Ilero mused a while and said, I remember now an afternoon in early youth when searching idly through the unused vaults of our palace as a boy might do, I came to the last vault and found therein a dusty uncouth image of clay, whose form and countenance were strange to me. And knowing not the prophecy, I turned away in disappointment and went back as idly as I had come to seek the moated sunlight. Then, stealing away from their heedless kinfolk and carrying jeweled lamps they had taken from the hall, Hestion and Alero went downward by subterranean stairs beneath the palace and threading like implacable furtive shadows the maze of nighted corridors, they came at last to the lowest crypt. Here, in the black dust and clotted cobwebs of an immemorial past, they found, as had been decreed, the clay image, whose rude features were those of a forgotten earthly god. And Alero shattered the image with a fragment of stone, and he and Hestayan took from its hollow center a great sword of unrusted steel, and a heavy key of untarnished bronze, and tablets of bright brass on which were inscribed the various things to be done, so that Sinker should be rid of the dark reign of the necromancers, and the people should win back to oblivious death. So, with the key of untarnished bronze, Ilero unlocked as the tablets had instructed him to do, a low and narrow door at the end of the nethermost vault, beyond the broken image, and he and Hestayan saw, as had been prophesied, the coiling steps of somber stone, that led downward to an undiscovered abyss, where the sunken fires of earth still burned. And leaving Ilero toward the open door, Hestayan took up the sword of unrusted steel in his thin hand and went back to the hall where the necromancers slept, lying asprawl on their couches of rose and purple, with the one bloodless dead about them in patient ranks. Upheld by the ancient prophecy and the lore of the bright tablets, Hestayan lifted the great sword and struck off the head of Matmua and the head of Sodosma, each with a single blow. Then, as had been directed, he quartered the remains with mighty strokes, and the necromancers gave up their unclean lives and lay supine without movement, adding a deeper red to the rose and a brighter hue to the sad purple of their couches. Then, to his kin, who stood silent and listless, hardly knowing their liberation, the venerable mummy of Hestian spoke in seer murmurs, but authoritatively, as a king who issues commands to his children. The dead emperors and empresses stirred, like autumn leaves in a sudden wind, and a whisper passed among them and went forth from the palace, to be communicated at length, by devious ways, to all the dead of Sinker. All that night, and during the blood-dark day that followed, by wavering torches or the light of the failing sun, an endless army of plague-eaten liches, of tattered skeletons, poured in a ghastly torrent through the streets of Yethlurium, and along the palace hall, where Hestayan stood guard above the slain necromancers. Unpausing with vague, fixed eyes, they went on like driven shadows to seek the subterranean vaults below the palace, to pass through the open door, where Ilero waited in the last vault, and then to wend downward by a thousand thousand steps to the verge of that gulf in which boiled the ebbing fires of earth. There, from the verge, they flung themselves to a second death and the clean annihilation of the bottomless flames. But after all had gone to their release, Hestayan still remained alone in the fading sunset, beside the cloven corpses of Matmua and Sodosma. There, as the tablets had directed him to do, he made trial of those spells of elder necromancy which he had known in his former wisdom, and cursed the dismembered bodies with that perpetual life and death, which Matmua and Sodosma had sought to inflict upon the people of Sinka. And maledictions came from the pale lips, and the heads rolled horribly with glaring eyes and the limbs and torsos writhed on their imperial couches amid clotted blood. Then, with no backward look, knowing that all was done as had been ordained and predicted from the first, the mummy of Hestayan left the necromancers to their doom, and went wearily through the nighted labyrinth of vaults to rejoin Alero. So, in tranquil silence, with no further need of words, Alero and Hestayan passed through the open door of the nether vault, and Alero locked the door behind them with its key of untarnished bronze. 
and thence, by the coiling stairs, they wended their way to the verge of the sunken flames, and were one with their kinfolk and their people in the last ultimate nothingness. But of Matmur and Sodosma, men say that their quartered bodies crawl to and fro to this day in Yethlirium, finding no peace or respite from their doom of life in death, and seeking vainly through the black maze of nether vaults, the door that was locked by Elero. This chilling tale was the first episode from Clark Ashton Smith's Zatheek Cycle. But the darkness doesn't end here. If this video reaches 100 likes, we'll unleash the Isle of the Torturers. The next haunting chapter in the cycle. Do you crave more cosmic horror? Stay tuned for more unspeakable legends.